There we go. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar. We're just going to get started in a moment. Just want to give a moment for anybody who might still need a, a minute to get logged in or to access the webinar uh, simultaneous translation to French. So while we do that, I'll just get started here. Uh, my name is Natalie Richardson. I am a melanoma survivor and the managing director at Save Your Skin Foundation. I welcome you to today's webinar presentation titled Melanoma Treatment, Frequently Asked Questions, Do's, Don'ts, and How to Manage Side Effects. We receive many questions from melanoma skin cancer patients and caregivers about targeted therapy and immunotherapy treatments available in the adjuvant and metastatic setting. Patients want to understand the efficacy of these innovative treatments, how they can expect to feel when taking them, and what to do if they encounter side effects, also known as adverse events. Patients always ask what is the latest news in melanoma treatment today and what their best options are for battling this disease. To help us answer these questions, we are honored to welcome two highly esteemed physicians from across Canada. Our valued panelists today are Dr. Michael Smiley, medical oncologist at the Cross Cancer Institute uh, and a professor at the Department of Oncology um, at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. We also have Dr. Marco Yafala, medical oncologist at William Osler Health System in uh, Brampton, Ontario, and he's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Dr. Smiley and Dr. Yafala will give us an updated snapshot of the melanoma treatment landscape in Canada, how it has advanced since the invention of immunotherapy, what patients can expect when receiving targeted therapy or immuno-oncology treatments, and how to manage the potential side effects that can occur. We'll get started on the presentations in just a moment, but first a few logistics. All participants uh, in the audience for today's webinar will be in listen-only mode for the duration of the session. There will be a question and answer portion at the end of the presentation. You will see at the right-hand side of your screen an option to type in a question under the word questions. Please feel free to ask these questions throughout the presentation, and we will do our best to answer them in the last segment. If there are any questions that do not get an immediate answer, we will contact you with a reply and any discussion you wish to have after the webinar. The session will be recorded and will be available for viewing on the Save Your Skin Foundation website and YouTube channel. Thanks again for joining us. We'll now begin the presentation. And while I hand the screen over to Dr. Smiley, I will give him a warm welcome and say, here's the screen. <laughs> and thank you so much for being with us this evening and sharing your insights uh, that we find of utmost value. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Dr. Smiley, and you can um, just let me know if you need anything. I will put myself on mute. Thank you again. Okay, well, thank you, Natalie, and welcome everybody. It's always a pleasure to work with Save Your Skin. So uh, what I wanna do is for the first 30 minutes is to give a brief overview of melanoma, where we are now. And Dr. Ayapolo is gonna go over the toxicity management. So these are my disclosures. And so this was uh, really the first half of my career. This was a meta-analysis presented in 2008 by Ed Korn that was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And really up until 2010, melanoma was a pretty dismal cancer. But this was a meta-analysis of cooperative group trials and it showed that the median survival with this disease was only about 6.2 months. And that 75% of all patients died within a year of diagnosis and 90% within two years of diagnosis. So it was really a depressing disease up until about 2010. And shortly after 2010, we started to get some positive studies and finally make some breakthrough in this disease that had been very resistant to treatment. And the big breakthroughs came through the identification of a mutated gene called BRAP, which is present in about 40% of all patients with melanoma. And using targeted therapy, initially with BRAP inhibitors by itself, and then with a combination of a BRAP plus a MEK inhibitor, we started to see median durations of response go to about 11, 12 months. And then the advent of immunotherapy um, using checkpoint inhibitors such as CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1. And just to show you how long this takes, CTLA-4 was actually discovered by Pierre Goldstein back around 1987, and our first positive trial was in 2010. So in the meta-analysis that was presented by Dirk Schattendorf, which combined um, over 1,800 patients with metastatic melanoma, they showed that the median overall survival was about 
0.4 months, but overall, but even more impressive is you see this survival curve really start to plateau at three years. And so they found that at three years survival is about 22% and five years survival is about 20%. So if you're alive at three years, you're likely allowed alive at five years. And BMS was actually allowed to say that ipilimumab was a potentially curative treatment because these patients were alive at three years. Most of them did not seem to recur from their uh, melanoma. Shortly after that, they combined the PD-1 inhibitors came out. There was another checkpoint. Um, that was discovered around 1992 by um, Hanji, Hanjo. And this showed that in the five years follow-up of the initial um, Keynote 006, which is a registration trial for pembrolizumab, it showed that the five-year survival rate was 38.7%. So we've gone from a five-year survival rate of around 5% up until um, greater than 38% just with the advent of one drug. So if you look at the dibrafenib plus trametinib, you look at the five-year overall survival with targeted therapy, it's about 34%. So very similar to the 38% that they see with, with pembrolizumab. So a little over a third of patients just with these um, two different treatment regimens are getting long-term survival. So they talk about really about this revolution in melanoma that since from about 2010 to 2015, we had a massive revolution in the treatment of melanoma, but from 2015, we've kind of plateaued off. We're kind of on a flat line, so we're, we're waiting for a big new upsurge. So if you have two effective therapies, the question that always comes up, and I still struggle with it, is, is do we go with targeted therapy or would you, do we go with immunotherapy? So how do you decide? So this was a paper that was published in the European Journal of Cancer by Yorkerel. And it showed that if you look at survival, there's an early survival advantage in favor of the targeted therapy with BRAF and MEK inhibitors. So this is the green line here. I apologize for anybody who's colorblind. Um, and if you look at the immunotherapy, the um, PD-1 inhibitors, which is red, and the CTLA-4 plus PD-1, which is black, you see that these curves cross just after a year, the survival curves cross. So longer term survival is in favor of immunotherapy as opposed to targeted therapy. So if you look at different subgroups of trying to answer the question, well, who should get targeted therapy first? Who should get immunotherapy? So if you look at the 067 study, which randomized patients to IPI plus NEVO versus nivolumab versus ipilimumab alone, you see, if you look at the BRAF mutant population, which is a group that you would consider using targeted therapy, you can see that the five-year survival rate is about 60% um, with, with combination therapy. It's about 46% with PD-1 and 30% for ipilimumab. If you look at the wild type, still in favor of the combination immunotherapy, but the difference is not as marked as what we see with the BRAF mutant population. So if we look at patients who have a normal lactate dehydrogenase. Again, um, it wasn't that long ago when patients who had an elevated uh, LDH, usually about greater than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal, were excluded from studies because they, they felt that those patients had such a, a bad prognosis that they would not respond to any therapy. We see with the normal LDH that, there, again, as expected, the survival is better. Um, again, in favor of the combination immunotherapy. And if you have an elevated LDH, five-year survival rate drops to about 38% with the combination therapy. If you look at LDH using a cutoff of two, two times the upper limit of normal, you can see that the um, for normal LDH less than two times the upper limit of normal, 55%, but if it's more than two times the upper limit of normal, it drops down to 28%. So still, about almost a third of patients are getting long-term survival, even if they have a grossly elevated LDH. So the slide's working a bit slow here, so. So my slide's not turning here, so. Oh, there there we is. go. You look at, again, if you look at, break down the subgroups, you look at patients with a normal LDH, and less than three sites of metastatic disease, you can see that two thirds of patients are alive at five years, 64% with combination immunotherapy and 58% with PD-1 alone. If you look at the group who's got the elevated LDH and greater than three sites of metastatic disease, again, five years survival drops down to about 32%. And just remember those, because when you look at targeted therapy, we look at the overall survival, um, 
I'm just going to try to close this thing. This thing is right in my way here. So. Yes, the, the little I, arrow at the top. Yep. This one? Um, there's like a beside the X, not the X, but the directly beside it, it's a little square with an arrow or the flat line that will also minimize it. Okay, it's smaller now. I think it's That moves okay. it. So yes, if there's a little so little look at the left of the square. Perfect. Five year survival overall survival with Dubrovnik plus Trametinib is the five year overall survival is 43% as opposed to um, the, if the LDH is elevated, it drops down to 16%. So this group here with an elevated LDH has a very poor out, long term outcome with targeted therapy. So if you look at um, overall survival, in patients who have a normal LDH, and remember it's about 66% with a combination immunotherapy, here it's about 55%. So um, again, pretty impressive five-year survival rates with almost two-thirds of patients alive in five years to get targeted therapy. So this is a group of patients who have an excellent prognosis with targeted therapy. So again, a normal LDH and less than three organ sites involved with metastatic disease. So the next question that comes is, if the slides change quickly. Uh, yes, PowerPoint. It's just lagging a bit. Freezing here, so. Yes, I sometimes find PowerPoint. There we go. Yeah. So sorry. So if you look at overall survival by best response, uh, um, and this is important early on. So if patients have a complete response, which is complete disappearance of tumor, then their five-year survival is in 71%. For those patients who get only a partial shrinkage or the best response of stable disease, those patients, a five-year survival drops down to 32 and 16% respectively. So I think is in this population here that if patients are in targeted therapy and they've not achieved a complete response, you really want to think about transitioning them over to immunotherapy before they get treatment resistance, because resi resistance crosses over to targeted therapy and immunotherapy. So if you look at the low burden patients, and just to summarize, so five-year survival with targeted therapy, so um, dubrafenib plus trametinib, 55%, and those in the checkmate 067, with a normal LDH and less than three sites, 64%. So fairly similar between the two. So I think it's really dealer's choice between if you have a patient with low volume disease and the normal LDH, which therapy you wanna deal, you wanna choose. And plus patients will often tell you which one they want. So how do we choose? Well, performance status is critical for all patients. I think for those patients with a borderline performance status, sort of ECOG2, I'm probably gonna go more combination immunotherapy. If the LDH is elevated, then probably again combination immunotherapy. The C-reactive protein is elevated, which is a marker of inflammation, then probably would go targeted therapy for these patients. If they have bulky disease, again, combination immunotherapy. Low volume disease, I think it's really dealer's choice, but there is no head-to-head -head studies comparing these two agents together. So it's really just sort of looking at the trials and trying to compare the trials. And also some patients may have a preference for oral as opposed to IV. And also toxicity comes into play, particularly when you look at the combination immunotherapy. So when you use the combination immunotherapy, this severe and life-threatening side effect, side effect profile, which we call grade three to grade four, is about 55%. So a lot of people look at this so-called what they call ipilimumab or ipilite. So they're using a lower dose of ipilimumab because most of the toxicity comes from the ipilimumab. So this was the 511 study, Checkmate 511, that looked at so what we call ipilite, so low dose ipilimumab plus nivolumab versus standard doses. And unfortunately, the primary endpoint of this study was the, um, to compare the incidence of treatment related grade three to grade four adverse events. And the secondary endpoints were to assess overall response rate, progression-free survival, and overall survival. And unfortunately, the trial was not powered to look for equivalency, which would have required a large number of patients. So this looked at NEVO plus IPI um, in low dose, or the IPI-1, NEVO-3, versus standard doses, which is NEVO-1 plus IPI-3. 
Um, they got six weeks of treatment. They went on to flat dose maintenance in the bottom up. And this did show that the response rates were fairly similar between IPI light versus standard doses, a little bit higher, but not statistically different. When you look at the waterfall plot, you see it's fairly similar. Um, and again, the IPI light had a 41% reduction in tumor volume, a little bit better for standard doses at 55.9. But when you look at overall survival, the progression-free survival, the curves are overlapping between the two. And also when you look at overall survival, the curves are overlapping. So there's no statistical difference between progression-free survival and overall survival. So unfortunately, this study was not powered to look at overall survival, but a lot of people now have gone for EP light because if you look at the toxicity, it's about almost half of what you see with standard doses of ipilimumab. So what about patients in who treatment doesn't work? So if you look at this, the curves here from the combi D, combi B, and the checkmate OSA7, you can see that the majority of patients still ultimately become resistant to therapy, either primary resistance where the treatment doesn't work up front or acquired resistance for both agents. Okay, so we know that the resistance immune checkpoint therapy is multifactorial. And there's this diagram that they call the immunogram that was presented by Pitt in the journal in Immunity. We know that the tumor, there's an interplay between the tumor microenvironment and other factors such as older age, uh, chronic infections, immunosuppression, smoking, um, HLA factors, along with the interaction between environmental factors such as diet and the microbiota, which is really in vogue now, and also um, endocrine and metabolicules such as obesity, diabetes, and other things that can affect the immune system. So tumor cells, I always say, are master manipulators at controlling the immune system, sorry. Uh, tumor cells can actually, when they establish their, gro their growth, they can secrete factors that will cause the bone marrow to release very primitive cells that we call myeloid-derived suppressor cells that will travel to the tumor and function to um, create a, a very immunosuppressed environment. They can recruit T regulatory cells. Um, they can downregulate antigen expression. Um, they can manipulate the checkpoints to turn off the immune system. And they can also release a variety of immunosuppressive factors such as interleukin-10, interleukin-6, and prostaglandins to suppress the immune system. So how do we overcome that resistance? Well, this is the active area of research right now. So you can look at novel um, immune checkpoint inhibitors, that many of which are in phase two or phase three trials, some in phase three or using combinations of checkpoint therapies to try to get a bigger bang for your buck. You can look at something called IDO inhibitors, which actually try to manipulate the tumor microenvironment. We know that tryptophan is, is a very um, early immunosuppressive. Um, that if you deplete tryptophan, it's immunosuppressive, and tumor cells will often upregulate an enzyme called IDO that will break down tryptophan. So when you get tryptophan depletion, you get an immunosuppressed environment. Unfortunately, although the phase two trials look very promising, that the phase three trial was a dismal failure. You can also try to enhance tumor in, um, immunogenicity by either adding in radiation, chemotherapy, or a drug called 5 a cytidine. 5 a cytidine is an old drug that was now used for myelodysplastic syndrome. But if you lose, use low dose azacytidine, you can actually upregulate the tumor um, profile, um, immunogenicity profile. You can also try to deplete T regulatory cells by using um, biologics such as antiox 40, anti CTLA4, 10 3 TIGET. You can also try to deplete the myeloid derived suppressor cells by using chemotherapy drugs such as gemcitabine or 5 fluorouracil cell. Or what's in early phase studies now is manipulation of the tumor environment. So trying to make a so called hot tumor where the immune cells move in um, versus cold tumors. So if you have a cold tumor, is that the lymphocytes will kind of go to this, the periphery of the tumor, but they won't go in. And so you try to manipulate the tumor to see if, if you can manipulate it and make a cold tumor hot. So these are just some of the checkpoints that are in clinical trials. And you can see there's been a whole explosion of checkpoints. And so there's a lot of, there's, um, I think over half, I think over well over a million patients that are involved now in immunotherapy um, trials worldwide. So this was the checkpoint 067, which is really a pivotal study um, in combining checkpoints. So this took patients with unresectable melanoma, 
and I stratified them and randomized them to either nivolumab plus ipilimumab versus nivolumab in standard doses plus ipi placebo versus ipilimumab alone. And this study was unfortunately powered to look at the difference between the nivolumab arm, so arm A and arm B versus ipilimumab alone. And it was not powered to look at these two arms, which is what everybody wanted to see to see if the combination of nevo plus ipi was better than nevo alone. But there was, it was planned for a descriptive analysis between these two arms. So if you look at the overall survival, we now have the five-year overall survival that was presented in 2019. And you can see that five-year survival now, remember it was 5% back in 2008. And here it's 52% it's at five years, 44% for the PD-1 arm, and 26% for the ipilimumab arm. So this is a case that we had that I always like, I've got a couple of cases in just to show how these, these drugs work in real life. So this was a patient, a 46 year old patient who was diagnosed with melanoma December, 2013. She completed her year of interferon. And then a PET CT scan done in March, 2016 showed that she had pulmonary metastases. So she started on nivolumab and she received nine cycles of nivolumab. But unfortunately, she presented in June 2016 with a new mass in her breast that was biopsied and confirmed to be mel melanoma. A CT scan at that time showed that she had a new right pleural effusion. She had studying around her abdominal cavity and possible adrenal metastases. So she was referred to Edmonton for possible trials. We did a CT of her head there, which showed a solitary brain metastasis. We referred her for stereotactic radiation. But unfortunately, the MRI showed that she had two brain metastases and she also had focal leptin meningeal disease, which is a contraindication to stereotactic radio surgery. So it wasn't that long ago in my career where if you were diagnosed with leptin meningeal disease, you usually went straight to palliative care. So in July 2016, she had a pleurex catheter inserted. She received four cycles of ipilimumab and nivolumab, which she completed in September of 2016. So again, remember that this patient was refractory to PD-1 therapy. You can see her brain metastasis here and her large pleural effusion. And you can see that at the end of treatment, September, she had a complete response to treatment. And she's out now over four years since she started treatment and still is remaining free of any melanoma recurrence. So there are definitely patients who progress on PD-1 who can be salvaged with combination immunotherapy. The trick now is trying to get this funded. So chemotherapy is also, you know, I was, when I trained, chemotherapy was largely taught as it was a cytotoxic agent. But if you think of chemotherapy, is that we can cure some tumors with, with chemotherapy. And it would, theoretically, it should be impossible to cure tumors. So there's obviously something else going on. And it's now known that chemotherapy can often reset that so-called immune threshold um, and sort of kickstart the immune system to get rid of any residual cancers. So we know that certain drugs such as 5-fluorouracil and gemcitabine will deplete deplete myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Um, platinum agents can upregulate death receptors and, and uh, enhance the immune system killing cancer cells. So really, the, we have to look to see if there's additive or synergistic effects between chemotherapy and radiation. And certainly recently in lung cancer, they showed that the combination of chemotherapy plus immunotherapy was better than chemotherapy alone. So radiation, we also know, has some immunologic effects that early on in radiation, you get a large release of tumor-associated um, antigens because you're killing a lot of tumor cells. You get upregulation of the immune cells, and plus you get T-cell migration in the tumors, but the tumors are rapidly able to overcome this and, and again, set up an immunosuppressed environment. So obviously by combining the two, you hope to get some synergistic effect. So this was a patient that we had, a 38-year-old woman who was diagnosed with a, a mucosal melanoma of her anal canal in September 2015. We had recommended neoadjuvant ipilimumab and nivolumab, um, but she declined that, and she also declined, a, declined surgical resection, which would be a colostomy. She returned to the Philippines to visit her family. She came back a couple months later. Um, and she underwent local excision, but unfortunately, as un not unexpectedly, she recurred in October 2016. Um, she underwent a, a resection at that time with a colostomy, and she had a seven centimeter recurrence and three of 33 lymph nodes were positive. So unfortunately, she recurred again in March 2017 with a recurrence in her vaginal vault and introitus. 
Uh, she was assessed by gynae oncology, felt to be inoperable, so she started pembrolizumab in April 2017. She had a PET scan in July. She had some mild local progression. It was still all local, so we kept on with the pembrolizumab. In October 2017, she had further progression. Um, and then shortly after that, she presented with heavy vaginal bleeding and came in and her hemoglobin had dropped to 62. So we referred her to radiation treatment. Initially, she declined radiation, but eventually accepted it. She received just a very low dose of radiation, 2000 centigrade, so just a palliative dose in, from December 20th to December 27th. Um, and in September 2018, a follow-up PET scan showed that she had a complete metabolic and radiological response. So this patient had progression through two PET scans and just by the addition of radiotherapy, we got a complete response to treatment. She remains in complete response at this period. So this is her PET scans. You can see the baseline, you can just see a couple small recurrences here and along the vaginal introitus here. And then by October, there's clear progression um, along the introitus and up deep into the pelvis. And then October 2019, she's had not just a complete radiological response, she's had a metabolic response too. So there's no um, increased glucose uptake in this area. So the last thing I want to talk about that's the big in vogue system is your inner ecosystem or commonly known as your microbiota, so the, the bugs in your gut. So we know that when we're born into this world, we're completely sterile. And after birth, we're exposed to a whole um, variety of microbes um, through our GA, GI, GU, respiratory, and skin. The gastrointestinal system has the largest diversity and abundance of microbes. There's over 100 trillion organisms, mostly bacteria. The collective genome, the so-called metagenome of GI microbiota has about 100 times out of the human genome. And each individual is populated by about 15% of the thousand or more species of intestinal bacteria that have been described. So we have 10 times more genes in our microbiome um, than our bodies. And this is where most of the immune system is felt to be um, tuned in. So what do the bacteria get from us? Well, they get a warm and nutrient-rich environment. Um, and we, in return, get a highly adaptive metabolic engine that controls everything from obesity to type 2 by diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and very critical in maintaining immunostasis and our immune system. So we know that upsets in this can cause autoimmune diseases such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, type 2 diabetes. So there's good bacteria that inhibit pathogen growth. They're the commensals. They convert pro-drugs to active metabolites. Um, they degrade polysaccharides, they produce folic, folic acid, vitamin K, um, and they modulate the immune function. The bad ones can cause sepsis, infection, inflammation, liver damage, production of carcinogens, diarrhea, and constipation. So what's the evidence in animal models? There's several studies um, showing that, that changes in the microbiota can affect treatment uh, response to immunotherapy. So if you take mice, and you grow human tumors in them, and then you give them antibiotics to sterilize their gut, or you raise them in sterile conditions and inject um, human tumor cells into them, and let the tumor cells um, grow, and then treat them with PD-1 therapy, they do not respond to immunotherapy. If you take mice that are raised similarly, again, sterilize their, their gut using the antibiotics, and then do a fecal transplant from a mouse that's previously responded to immunotherapy, and treat them with immunotherapy, the, the mice will then respond to treatment. So there are several bacteria that are shown. And unfortunately, these studies are all over the map. There are three studies done in three different parts of the world. They all showed that certain types of bacteria predicted response to immunotherapy, but they were different bacteria. So the ones we know that are good are the Bifidobacterium, um, Bacteroides fragilis, and Burkholda cepacia. And there's other bacteria that are associated with a bad outcome with immunotherapy. And unfortunately, our Western diet is probably more um, inhibitory to immunotherapy than um, conducive to immunotherapy responses. So there have been several publications now. There is a whole um, consortium looking at different uh, um, studies using gut microbiopes and trying to st um, stimulate better immune responses. And there's different ways you can affect the microbiota. So first of all, you can feed it. So we know that in Western society, we do not feed it well. Like going to McDonald's and Burger King is not feeding your microbiota very well. So you want to get lots of grains, fruits, vegetables in there. So there's always a new food um, that's in vogue. There's there, anything that seems to be purple, like um, 
acai berries, there's, there's um, beets, there's um, grains, there's nuts, um, broccoli. They all help to sort of foster a good environment for your, pro, your good probiotics to um, survive. You can also change it so you can try to take um, probiotics. You can take these defined consortiums that are grown from fecal cultures in patients that have responded to therapy. And it's usually, um, it's grown in the laboratory so you don't have to do the actual fecal transplant. And then you can actually try to swap it. So you could take a patient and take a, a feces from a patient who's previously responded and then do a fecal transplant on that patient and then treat them with immunotherapy to see if they respond. So these are just some of the studies that are going on right now. So it's a huge field right now, um, trying to manipulate the GI system to respond to immunotherapy. So what does the future hold? Well, this little cartoon here shows that there is, is cancer is a very, very complicated process. But you can see there's a, there's a whole plethora of drugs that we can use to try to alternate. We can try to use drugs that present affect antigen presentation such as STING. So STING is just a stimulator of interferon genes. We can use the toll-like receptors. We can use viruses. So there's many what we call oncolytic viruses. So there's one that's uh, approved in the US called TVEC. They take a herpes virus, they, they modify it so that it cannot replicate in normal cells. And they add GMC aseptic, and then they use, there's studies now looking at the TVEC vaccine plus PD-1 versus PD-1 alone. We can try to alter the stroma, which I think is fascinating. So using drugs like interleukin-8 or inhibitors of CCR2 or 5. We can um, block inhibitory checkpoints. We have these two in clinical practice, but there's several others coming along. We can um, activate an effector T cells, such as using interleukin-2, ICOS. And one of the drugs that I think is really interesting is the CSF1R. So if you look at the macrophages, so when you get tumor development, Macrophages are kind of like the Pac-Man of the immune system. They come in and sort of gobble things up, but they're also very important in regulating the immune response. So we know that when macrophages migrate into tumor, they're usually anti-pathogenic um, and they have some anti-tumor activities, but macrophages have a lot of plasticity, so they can be molded in the tumor microenvironment. So they can be transformed by the tumor into from what we call an anti-tumor macrophage, an M1, into a tumor-promoting macrophage, or commonly known as M2. So if you treat with drugs like CSF1R, you can actually re-educate the macrophages to go from pro-tumor to anti-tumor. So in conclusion, we have over a thousand immuno-oncology drugs that are occurring in clinical trials involving millions of patients. Several novel agents and combinations are already in phase three trials. The tumor microenvironment is a prime target, but again, we don't really know what to target yet. So there's some very interesting um, studies coming out of that. Biochemotherapy, so combining chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, which makes me feel old because when I was um, back in the early 90s, biochemotherapy was the rage. We're using interleukin-2 and interferon with chemotherapy. The gut microbiota will almost certainly be a therapeutic option in the future. And the treatment of melanoma, as I said, has plateaued, but I think we're, we're waiting for the next big breakthrough. So I think from 2020 to 2025, we'll have a period very similar to the 2010 to 2015 where we'll make a lot of breakthroughs. And with that, I'll finish my presentation. And if anybody, I think you're doing questions at the end, correct? Yes, yeah, we'll just save questions for the end. Thank you so much, Dr. Smiley. That was really interesting, very interesting. I'm just going to switch the screen over to Dr. Yafala. It's on its way. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smiley, yeah. for your talk. Um, can everyone hear me right now? Yes, sir. And see my slides? Perfect. So yeah. um, thank, you. Uh, thank, thank you for inviting me back to this um, to Save Your Skin webinar. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be part of this webinar right now. And I'm going to take over for the second half right now talk more about the uh, management of side effects and the type of side effects that can pop up with a little bit of theory that may overlap a bit with Dr. Smiley's. And so this is my disclosures and a quick, we're going to be talking briefly about the immunotherapy and then the targeted therapy side effect management. So beginning with immunotherapy, you know, this is the biggest revolution right now in cancer treatment. It's completely changing our landscape of how we're going to be treating these diseases. And so much so that Oops. It recently led to the Nobel Prize laureate, these two gentlemen right here that were involved in the development of the immunotherapy that, again, of course, has transformed how we treat these diseases. Um, 
I find this to be a very interesting slide, and I always like to refer back to it whenever we talk about immunotherapy. So for those people in the audience who may not have a lot of physiology knowledge, you know, essentially all of our cells in our body contain the exact same genetic sequence, but it's our various genes that are turned off and on with each cell that defines one cell versus another, a bone cell, a skin cell, a cardiac or heart cell, for example. And cancer, essentially what happens is that something occurs along the way where the genes are altered and it changes the proteins that those genes make that essentially leads to those cells I'll have ongoing proliferation, they grow and divide and they spread throughout the body and they create this cancer picture that we treat. And we know that certain types of cancer cells have more mutations or changes in their genetic sequences than other cells. And we know this is quite important because if you can see here on the graph on the y-axis right here, it gives you an idea of how many mutations are present. And here on the top, on the x-axis, we have a whole host of different cancer cells. And if you go all the way to the right side, this is what we're talking about right now, melanoma. It harbors the largest amount of different types of uh, mutation, uh, largest amount of mutations in any type of cancer cell, which completely changes the types of proteins that it makes. And that's very important because our immune system is designed to recognize foreign protein structures that then go out to target and kill those cells, commonly viruses, bacteria, but in this case, cancer cells. And so the immune system plays such a large role in clearing cancer cells. In fact, these certain types of lymphoma cells are made in our body every day that our body clears before we even develop any form of cancer syndrome. And so for this reason, the immune checkpoints, that is kind of the new wave of immunotherapy, were really designed with melanoma in mind. And because of the profound effects we've had against melanoma, they're now being used to investigate different disease sites or different types of cancers within the body. And when it comes to the immune system, I like to use the analogy of essentially driving a car. A car going forward represents the activity of the immune system. There's two ways to make that car go faster. You have to step on the gas or you take your foot off the brake. And the immune system is really no different. There's the things that stimulate or upregulate the immune system, and then there's different parts that help downregulate the immune system. And so our body naturally has this homeostasis to achieve that perfect balance where it can go out, the immune, the immune system can go out, kill the foreign-looking proteins and cells, but not so overactive that it starts an annihilating and attacking our normal tissues. And when that occurs, we call those autoimmune or rheumatologic conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera. And so we're now trying to exploit these differences that Dr. Smiley had touched on before to help make sure we can upregulate the immune system in many ways uh, in order to have some anti-cancer effects. And so as a result, we talk about these immune checkpoints, which are really the breaks on the immune system. And the two drugs that have gained the most fame because they're a routine and clinical practice, the CTLA-4 and the PD-1 or PDL one those are like taking your foot off the brake, essentially. So it takes away the inhibition or the checkpoint on the immune system, and then the car flies forward and does the dirty work to kill the cancer cells. There are a whole host of other ways that the tumors can help evade the immune system. They can excrete these suppressive molecules. They can recruit some immune suppressive cells that dampen down the immune system. And these remain active areas of research to determine if these sites can be targeted to help increase our anti-cancer effects. And so just to briefly talk about the two main players in clinical practice, the CTLA-4, we use ipilimumab as discussed before to help target the cancer. Um, if you see here, uh, the T cell is really the cell that does the majority of the anti-cancer fighting. And this APC stands for an antigen presenting cell. And we can see here that in the first part, the T cell is activated mainly because this CD28 receptor on the T cell binds to the CD8, so CD80 slash 86 um, protein on the antigen presenting cell. And we can downregulate the T cell activation or dampen its anti-cancer response if the CTLA-4 protein on the T cell binds to that same CD80 slash 86 uh, protein on the antigen presenting cell. If Illumimab exerts its effects, it blocks that CTLA-4, and hence this receptor here on the T cell is, remains chronically activated and attached to the CD80-86, and so the T cell remains turned on and off it goes flying to do the dirty work against the cancer. The other main player we use in clinical practice are our PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors, somewhat similar in many ways. Here's our T cell that does the anti-cancer fighting, and here's a tumor cell. This antigen, that's a foreign protein made by that tumor cell, again, because there's been some change in genetic sequences in that tumor cell that made this new protein. And although the T cell can recognize it through its T cell receptor, this PD1, PD, sorry, PDL1 
on the tumor cell can bind to the PD-1, and that would normally turn off the T cell. So it's kind of like shaking a politician shaking hands with the uh, with the uh, T cell, turning it off in this setting. But the PD-1 or PD-L1 drugs that we use, these kind of antibody-looking structures here, they block that interaction between the PD-1 and L1, and hence there is no dampening of that T cell. It recognizes that foreign antigen and off it goes forward to fight that tumor cell. And as Dr. Smiley had touched on before, there's a whole host of different checkpoints used to either turn up or turn down the immune system. And I've well, I highlighted only two right here that we're currently using, but you can imagine all sorts of other ones right now are undergoing clinical investigation to see if we can increase our anti-tumor response. But the problem is, though, is that when you have an imbalance in our immunologic tolerance, now our immune system runs forward, and then we develop these autoimmune pictures, very much akin to what we see in patients who suffer from autoimmune conditions, irrespective of checkpoint inhibitors. Again, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, organ disease, et cetera. A lot of the side effects of immunotherapy mimic these chronic diseases that some people suffer from in society. And so no tissue is really left unharmed as a result. We call these immune-related adverse events for obvious reasons. And if you can see here on this diagram, and I really like to use this diagram when I talk to patients about to be treated with immunotherapy, it really highlights that no structure is left untouched by the immune system. I essentially say point to anywhere you want in your body, and we have some degree of documentation that the immune system has packed that part of the body in, in clinical trials or in various investigations. But some sites are certainly more prone than others to this side effect. And so when we talk about the onset of these immune-related adverse events, they come in different ways. Now, this is actually relatively old data from about 10 to 12 years ago. But the reason why I like to highlight it is that it's using a very large dose of ipilimumab. Now, when, when we talk about the toxicity profiles between uh, anti-CTLA-4 like ipilimumab or nivolumab, which is an anti-PD-1 uh, inhibitor, the CTLA-4s like ipilimumab tend to be more toxic. And as Dr. Smiley was talking before about the different doses or ipi light, he was talking about one milligram per kilo body weight of the patient or three milligrams per kilo body weight. This study was done at 10 milligrams. So I like to highlight kind of the most severe type of dosing we can give to the patients. And as a result, some of the more severe side effects that can onset. And as you can see here, either the skin, the colon, the liver, or the small part of the brain called the pituitary can be affected at different intervals. Same here when we expand to different parts of body tissues. Not surprisingly, when we combine the different types of immunotherapies, our side effect profile gets worse. So we grade our toxicities from essentially one, which is minimal, or five, which is side effects so severe that it unfortunately were to kill the patient. And we use this as part of the common terminology criteria for adverse events, short form is CTCAE. And here kind of gives you a description from the mild ones all the way down to the most severe form where the treatment would unfortunately kill the patient from the side effect. And as you can see here, with the, there's so much summative or the, how the side effect profiles increase when we talk about ipilimumab versus nivolumab or the combination of the two, upwards of 55% will develop a severe side effect on this combination treatment. And we know that uh, across all sorts of different types of tissues that the combination of immunotherapy is worse. So we have here along column one running vertically different types of body tissues, pneumonitis being the lungs, enterocolitis being your intestinal tract, hepatitis being your liver, nephritis kidneys, dermatitis skin, neuropathies are the various nerves, endocrinopathies are your endocrine glands, glands are the glands that secrete various hormones in our bodies. They can all be affected. And I'm not going to read this in detail, but essentially, as you move along from a CTLA-4 inhibitor, ipilimumab, or the PD-1, Pembro, or Nevo, we see that the severity is much worse when they are combined across all forms of different types of tissues that may be affected. The key part is, is catching these side effects early. Vigilance is key for the clinician, and education is key for the patient so they are aware of the side effects and we give them good contact information to get a hold of us if they are worried so we can intervene earlier. Earlier intervention with an earlier grade of toxicity will always lead to better outcomes, and we might have the chance of maintaining these life-sustaining treatments as opposed to having to abandon them entirely because the side effects became too severe. The general management of these side effects is not surprisingly an immunosuppressant. These are immune-stimulating drugs we're using. 
So we're going to try to turn around their effects by dampening the immune system. We would commonly use something called glucocorticosteroids as our first line treatment, and we would escalate to more intensified or different types of immunosuppressive drugs if we're not achieving appropriate side effect control with the steroids alone. And again, as you can see here on column one, we talk about the grading of our side effect, the CTCAE, as we spoke about before, and just how about we can go managing them. The biggest concern though, is if you get all the way to a grade four, which is very critically ill from a side effect, the problem is, is that you're almost certainly gonna to wanna to discontinue these drugs permanently. If we can catch it very early at grade one, you may not even have to stop these immunotherapies. And that's why I really stress patient education uh, and vigilance amongst the clinicians. As mentioned before, the steroids are the cornerstone for treatment. You can't just give the steroids, let the side effect resolve, and then stop. It doesn't work that easily. There's two main reasons for that. Well, one, your adrenal glands make your own steroid medications, and if you're on high-dose steroids to control the side effect from the immunotherapy, your adrenal glands shut down. And usually the rule of thumb is if you're on a, a, a corticosteroid that would shut down your adrenal glands for about two weeks, you get very sick if you just stop the steroids all of a sudden, because now your body won't make them because your adrenal glands have become quiescent or dormant, and it takes a bit of time for them to kick in. So that's the more obvious one we would learn in medical school. But the, the, uh, the trick for the oncology practice is that if you were to stop the, uh, um, the steroids all of a sudden, there's a good chance that that immune-related adverse event is going to reflare as a result. So what we do is once we achieve clinical stability of the side effect, we then slowly lower the dose of the steroid over the span of many weeks, no more than four weeks. The reason is, is that, we, again, we can have reflaring of the side effect if we're not careful if we decrease it too slow. And sometimes even when we do decrease it slowly, the side effect still reflares as we drop the dose of the steroid. And all the steroids can be quite beneficial at times. You can't leave people on them long term because side effects of those steroids are going to start to accumulate in time if we're not careful. And so there's certain types of nuances amongst the different tissues that can be involved in immune-related adverse events. So with colitis or inflammation of the colon, you know, this can have a waxing, waning approach as a result. So we want to have a nice, long, prolonged steroid taper. The endocrinopathies or if your different types of endocrine glands are affected, there's a good chance you're going to have to replace that hormone. We'll talk a little bit about uh, impact of the thyroid gland, but essentially if your immune system has destroyed your thyroid gland, it's not going to wake back up. It's not going to come back. It's not going to make any more thyroid hormones. Patients, as a result, are now on lifelong hormone replacement. And just because you had one side effect doesn't mean that that's where the buck stops. People can get multiple different sites developing simultaneously. So again, vigilance is key and education is key. Just to name a few of the more common ones, here we have some various types of dermatitis that can, ident that can develop from uh, checkpoint inhibitors. It can range from something relatively trivial, like kind of a what we call a macular papular rash, or kind of redding or raised lesions on the skin. Tend to be relative, they can tend to be itchy or a little bit discomforting, but it can become much more severe to the point we get something called bolus pemphigoid, that we get these big water-based blisters. And even worse, I don't have a picture of it, but something called Steven Johnson syndrome. And they kind of show us what we call sequelae or the consequences of some of these uh, diagnoses. So here with dermatitis, people get itchy or tight skin. It becomes painful or burning. If the skin layers start to break down and open up, the bacteria that normally uh, live in our skin or our normal skin flora can then invade and cause various types of infections. These fluid-filled blisters can collect various types of salt, and the fluid can shift from where it should normally be within your blood vessels into here, and you can have issues with the amount of blood pressure that's running around. And for Steven Johnson syndrome, which is by far almost certainly the most severe form of skin reaction you can get, your skin can actually just fall off and your mucous membranes, mainly within your mouth or elsewhere in the body, can start to just sloth off. It's a big problem. So here in, uh, in Brampton, where I work, we are, are in Ontario, and so Cancer Care Ontario has developed various forms of guidelines to help manage the various forms of side effects from these immunotherapies or checkpoint inhibitors. And again, we go back to the CTCAE grading to help give us, the clinicians, guidance about how, how we are going to go about treating these patients. And again, one being relatively trivial, four being extremely severe, five being so bad that the patient succumbed to death from it. 
And so here we can see if we're going to need to get um, how we describe the severity of the grade, if referral to other form of specialists are needed, the type of steroids we use, and other form of supportive management that may be required to help ensure this patient can get through the side effect. And then most importantly as well is that once we get them through the side effect, should we be re-challenging these patients with these immunotherapy drugs? And again, I can't stress enough the catching these side effects early so we can avoid a severe grade four reaction, which will almost certainly lead to complete discontinuation of therapy. And I'd hate to expel a patient short on the potential therapeutic benefit of this because the side effect got too severe. Uh, switching gears slightly, looking now at the colon. So this can either manifest as diarrhea, which we define as an increase in stool frequency. Um, we always need to know the patient's baseline bowel habits because it's all relative as the of change in the frequency. So if someone is having a baseline bowel movement function of three times a day before they ever had immunotherapy, and now they're going three or now they're going sorry four or five times a day, it's actually not that big of an issue. But if you're going once every two days and now you're going four to five times per day, that's a much larger issue as a result because that's a big change from your normal routine. We talk about something called, uh, called colitis, which refers to inflammation of the colon, but this is more than just diarrhea. It's diarrhea combined with actual inflammation. And here with our CT scan and for, for the um, general population out there, this is kind of a cross section, like ear to ear going down the body. And this is a large colon of the patient. Here it is super thick looking because it's all inflamed. And this is the lumen or the actual tube of the colon. If you were to get a colonoscopy where they put a long, thin telescopic camera up the bum to look at the colon, you would see this very friable, angry looking colon as a result of the inflammation caused by these immune checkpoint inhibitors. And so looking at about when it's going to ensue, so um, various types of studies have been done for this either CTLA-4, the pdl ones have not been formally reported. We talk about the incidence or the severity of the grade of these two different agents. And again, the sequelae are the consequences of this. So I get very worried about colitis because if people and patients are losing lots of fluid out their back end, they drop their blood pressure and they can have low blood pressure can lead to a whole host of other issues. The heart tries to compensate for low blood pressure by beating faster. If you have underlying cardiac condition or heart condition, the heart may not be able to withstand such stress. You can develop heart failure. Um, cardiac, um, uh, sorry, heart attack, cardiac arrest, et cetera. You lose a lot of electrolytes at your back end when you're having diarrhea that can then play a whole host of problems within the body, heart, nerves, et cetera. And if you're actually having so much friable tissue in the colon, you can start to hemorrhage and bleed out your back end as well. So these are the very scary things that I counsel patients on. And again, here's our various gradings about how we would go about ranking the severity of either the diarrhea or the colitis. And so when it comes to management, it's actually a little bit sometimes trickier than the skin. We're always worried about an infectious cause because, of course, people on immunotherapy can still get infections. And one of the things we are notoriously hard to get rid of in the hospitalized session setting is a bug called C. difficile, these little spore-like bacteria that can colonize the colon and lead to very bad diarrhea outputs. And so usually we, before we give somebody an immunosuppressant that would also help inhibit the body's ability to fight an infection, we really need to make sure that we clear that infection out first to make sure it's not a possibility of the reason why they're presenting as such. So first we take a look for infection or sometimes we treat if the patient is very sick, we'll treat simultaneously with steroids and anti-infective agents because we just don't have the luxury of time to wait for the anti-infective test to come back first. And then depending upon the severity, we have different management plans. If it's just a grade one or a mild increased output of stool, we can talk about antidiarrheal agents, commonly loperamide, also known as Imodium. Another drug we like to use is Lomoxil. We suggest a low solute diet, not too much roughage as a result. When it becomes more severe, grade two or higher, right away we're on the steroid, either an oral steroid like prednisone or an intravenous steroid, methylprednisolone. And then we would commonly get our gastrointestinal colleagues involved to make sure we're not missing anything else. If these symptoms are not resolving, despite appropriate steroid use, we then escalate our treatments to stronger immunosuppressive drugs, here being a drug called infliximab. And again, of course, CCO has their own guidelines about exactly how to manage some of these side effects. So I'm just looking at the clock right now, so I don't want to go over budget. Um, talking about the liver and its inflammation, 
I find most patients usually present asymptomatic. We do our routine blood work before the next dose of immunotherapy, and all of a sudden we see the liver enzymes elevated. And for lack of better description, essentially what's going on here is that your liver enzyme, your liver cells are starting to explode open, releasing these enzymes, and then we see it free floating in your blood work and what we sample in your peripheral blood in your veins. And so the uh, consequences of this for the patients and things to watch out for is that your liver is a remarkable organ that has multiple different things. If it's not processing your bilirubin properly, and that's the kind of brown pigment that stains your stool, backs up into the blood as a consequence, and you get something called jaundice, yellowing of the skin or yellowing of the eyes. Your liver also plays in a very important role in regulating your glucose levels or your sugar levels. And if it's impaired, your sugar drops, and you get very sick as a consequence of that. It makes a very important protein called albumin. And that helps increase our blood pressure and keep the fluid within our blood vessels and not leak out to our surrounding tissues. And if that goes low, the blood pressure drops, your heart rate goes off, you start to get, get something called edema or pooling of the fluid, usually in gravity-dependent areas, commonly the ankles and legs. The liver also makes our blood clotting factors. And if that's not working properly, you get bleeding disorders. And our liver clears a whole bunch of toxins. And if it's not clearing those toxins properly, those toxins get lodged into the brain. And as a result, people get highly confused and delirious and become extremely sick. CCO again has its own management depending upon the grade of severity and just how to escalate treatment. Speaking of the thyroid gland, it's a very common yet relatively asymptomatic site. We, again, we usually pick this up on routine blood work. We see that there's some degree of thyroid dysfunction. As I was mentioning before, that thyroid tissue gets destroyed by immune system. It is not growing back and patients are usually stuck on some degree of thyroid replacement. What usually happens though, is that as the thyroid is destroyed by the immune system, again, some of before in simplistic terms, it releases a bunch of pre-made thyroid hormones in those cells. As those cells explode open, it releases a whole bunch of thyroid hormones. So patients actually develop a very transient hyperthyroidism. They look like they have too much thyroid hormone on board, but again, that's just because the cells are broken open. And then shortly after, we see a crash in the thyroid hormone. So we have this transient rise, and then it falls down, and it never comes back up again. And that's when we start initiating a thyroid replacement supplement, usually something called levothyroxine. CCO, again, has management for either the hypothyroid picture or the hyperthyroid picture. I'm not going to belabor the points, but I'm happy to share the slides if necessary. Um, a relatively well, uncommon yet very serious form of side effect side is something effect. called hypophysitis. Now, this is referring to our pituitary gland. It's very small tissue here in the deep parts of the brain. And this regulates the vast majority of our hormones to go to various parts of the body to stimulate our adrenal glands, our thyroid glands, etc. So as a consequence, if the immune system decides to attack this little part, many different, uh, sorry, many different hormones are now not being made. And by far, you need to get a hormone specialist, someone called an endocrinologist, to dive in and to help you manage these hormone dysregulations. And again, CCO has strict guidelines to help guide us as a clinician to help manage patients who would suffer from this side effect. Uh, just to um, reiterate, you know, education and anticipation are going to be key for these patients and then high vigilance of the clinician to make sure that we detect these things early and treat them early. Because if we can do this properly, we can keep people on track with their treatment and help give them better anti-cancer control. Um, I'm just, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna go past this part. Um, one thing for the patients in the audience that would be curious to know, a lot of people are worried that if we're giving you drugs to stimulate the immune system to attack the cancer, they're worried that by giving you immunosuppressive drugs to dampen the side effects from the immunotherapy, that it's going to also dampen their anti-cancer response. That is not quite the situation, fortunately, though. We can see here that a good chunk of people, nearly two, or just over two-thirds of patients who develop a bad side effect from treatment, so bad that they had to discontinue the nivolumab and nivolumab, had developed a response. And a lot of people still develop a response after the drug is discontinued. There's a lot of evidence, although not fully strengthened yet, that patients who do develop a side effect from immunotherapy actually have better outcomes, though, somewhat of a silver lining to a dark cloud. Switching gears very quickly, so the BRAF and MEK inhibition profiles for their side effects, um, just very briefly for the theory, completely different mechanism we're talking about now for a melanoma treatment. 
So essentially, if this is your cancer cell wall outside of the cell and here it's inside of the cell, normally we have a regulated relay race of various protein and enzymes that from an external outside of the cell growth factor would bind and a whole host of stuff, stuff would relay for down to proliferation. The problem is in people who have a BRAF mutation, this is chronically turned on even in the absence of an external growth factor stimulus, which leads to this constant proliferation of the cancer cells, growing, dividing, spreading throughout the body. And as a result, the targeted drugs, the BRAF drugs, block this spot right here based upon the mutation profile. And because of the side effects from the BRAF monotherapy, inhibiting the MEK can actually help reduce some of the side effects that we'll touch on right now. So the common side effects when we combine the two drugs, fevers and chills are by far the ones that plague patients the most. I find it gives them a lot of headaches and interrupted course of treatment. The skin becomes much more sensitive to the sun, rashes development. You can actually, sorry, rashes develop. You can actually develop secondary skin cancers if you're treated with a BRAF inhibitor alone. And that was one of the main impetus behind combining with a MEK inhibitor to help reduce the can chance of developing a secondary skin cancer from the BRAF inhibitors alone. Other things, fatigue, the liver can become damaged. The way the electricity is conducted through the heart can be affected. It can run a bit slower. It can develop heart trouble or an eye damage, though. So as a result, you want to monitor your blood, looking at your liver. We get regular ultrasounds of the heart. Look at the electrical flow through the heart with an ECG. We get our dermatology colleagues and ophthalmology colleagues involved. And when there is some degree of side effect, we commonly would hold the drug, wait for the side effect to blow over and go back to baseline, and then we may or may not advise a dose reduction in these medications. So the secondary skin cancers, the reason for this is that these patients, the patients who develop, I'm sorry, patients on BRAF monotherapy develop skin cancers called squamous cell carcinomas and keratoacanthomas. And that's because of the way there is an activation of that pathway I showed before if the BRAF is inhibited alone. And when they've done studies combining, comparing BRAF alone and BRAF with MEK, we can see that the secondary skin cancers are much lower, 2% if the combined treatment versus 9% if for the BRAF alone. Some of the common skin toxicities here is photosensitivity. You can see here the sun outline. You can almost see the shadowing of the chin of the, the, um, of the, from the sunlight and here right around the collar of where the shirt would have been. This is an example of a squamous cell carcinoma, a different type of skin cancer, and here the keratoacanthoma, another type of skin cancer. Various types of rash or ocular involvement from these drugs can occur. The pyrexia or the fever management is a big trouble for us. Here at my institution, this is our symbol for William Osler and Brampton, we developed our pathway to exactly how to manage these patients who suffer from a fever syndrome on these pills much more complicated right now in the COVID era because we're always going to be worried that they may have a secondary infection as a result. But commonly what we're going to do is that we're going to hold these medications, we're going to wait for the patient's symptoms to resolve, and then if they don't resolve in due time, we're going to do further workup and investigations. If they resolve in due time, we can discuss reinitiation of these medications. Um, so, you know, in summary with the immunotherapies, our highest risk of side effects come from combination therapy we nearly always start with steroid medications to help get the side effects under control. And then we are going to escalate to different types of immunosuppressive drugs if the steroids alone don't do it. And ultimately, once we get the side effect under control, there's a long course of steroid reduction over many, many weeks. For the BRAF and MEK inhibitors, fever is a big trouble right now. And then there's also that risk of secondary skin cancers. And questions, of course. Sorry for rushing at the end. I was just trying to be mindful of the time. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. That's uh, a lot of a lot of information. I, I don't imagine it's easy to um, just to summarize it so quickly. I don't know how you do it. So amazing. Thank you very much. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in. For the sake of time, I will um, will probably um, answer more by email. Um, but while I have just one question that, that I'll, I will just quickly throw out there, I've got a slide on the screen just showing some additional resources. Um, and you mentioned that you would be okay to share your slides, if that's all right, we, we will do that on, on SlideShare. Um, but also there are these other, other resources that we uh, referred to at Save Your Skin. Um, just last month, the NCCN released their new patient guidelines on immunotherapy. Uh, they can be accessed at the link below or from links on the Save Your Skin Foundation website and social media channels. 
Um, also, AMIT melanoma in the United States also have been working on resources supporting IO, but also targeted therapy. We collaborated with AIM to bring their FAQs on BRAF and melanoma to Canada. Uh, and this Q&A style document can also be found at the link below or on the Save Your Skin website. Um, so just a, a quick question. There's one thing that we are asked quite frequently by patients and caregivers. Um, is, there, is there anything in specifically that they should avoid eating or drinking or consuming um, if they're in immunotherapy or targeted therapy treatment, um, whether it be a dietary issue or if, it, if a patient chooses to seek additional advice from a naturopath, are there any specific supplements or treatments they should avoid in that regard? I'll open it to both of you. See if anybody wants to tackle that one. <laughs> Do you want to go first, Marco, or? <laughs> You're welcome to go first. It's a bit of a big question. <laughs> Well, I think this question comes up quite often with naturopaths, and I always tell patients that we don't know what the interactions are with these drugs, and certainly like there's always something new that's in vogue for cancer treatment, and so lately it's been the cannabinoids, and so there are some preclinical studies that suggest that THC may actually impair the immune system a little bit, so I always tell patients that these things are all unproven, um, and until they're really tested in, in formal studies and looked at drug interactions and safety, that I, I don't recommend it at this time. I think as far as the Dubrafen plus Trametinib, I think you have to be careful of citrus things like grapefruit and anything that may interfere with the binding. So our pharmacol pharmacists are pretty good. Like they will look at the patient's medication profile, look for any possible drug interactions. And so sometimes you may try to, like if you're on a proton pump inhibitor, you may try to switch the drugs to give them something that doesn't interact as much. I echo that as well. We have a to make sure we go over all these things with our patients upon uh, initiation of these treatments. Um, you know, because of the risk of liver issues, you know, certainly things like alcohol, Tylenol, and even some of the uh, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories can lead to these type of pictures. So as a clinician, whenever we see a bump in the patient's liver enzymes, we're always quizzing them about these type of other possible secondary diagnoses as opposed to the uh, anti-cancer drugs themselves. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned, for the sake of time, we will get back to everyone else with uh, questions. Some of the questions have been answered actually through your talks. So I'll just uh, circle back with those attendees and let them let them know that if they have any additional questions, we'll, we'll get back to them. Um, uh, again, I'd like to thank you both very, very much for sharing your insights with us. We appreciate your time today and in preparation for this session. And of course, thank you so much for all that you do for patients. We are eternally grateful. To, uh, Anytime. Thank you. And uh, to the audience, thank you for attending our webinar session. Uh, again, I'll mention this is recorded and will be available for viewing on the Save Your Skin Foundation website and YouTube channel uh, beginning tomorrow. If there are any other questions that have come up, please feel free to email them to me at natalie at uh, saveyourskin.ca. Um, thanks again, Fox, and thank you everyone for watching. With that, we'll end this webinar session. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.